going to be continuing this series on the Lord's Prayer, and I hope that you're finding this really beneficial as we're praying it together as a church. Let's just open in prayer together before we get into the word. Father, we just ask you in Jesus' name that you would come by your presence, Lord, wherever we are in our homes, in our cars, on our phones, on laptops, Father, wherever we might be, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would be with us, binding us together in unity, Father, although we can't be present together uh, face to face, Lord. Uh, you are present with us in spirit and we are present with one another. So, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you fill our hearts with your word and help us, Lord, as we come to this uh, understanding of what it is to forgive and ask for forgiveness. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week, you will remember that we looked at the kingdom of God and we were praying, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we were doing that. So the next part of the Lord's Prayer actually is give us this day our daily bread, which is fine, except that four weeks ago, Garth shared that message because we slightly did things out of uh, out of place. So we're not going to be covering that one again today. Instead, you're going to have to go back onto SoundCloud or onto our website and have a look at that and just refresh yourself about what that message meant. But just to recap quickly, because it was four weeks ago, is daily bread represents our daily needs. And Garth reminded us that we are totally reliant upon God for all of our needs to be met. And you know what? We have a need for one another. So as we think about that, you know, at the moment we're all sort of isolated in our homes and uh, we're trying our best to come together online and things like that. But one of the needs that has become acutely, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for, it's become uh, really apparent to us is that we actually need one another. We have a need for fellowship and we have a need for belonging. And when something as simple as meeting and gathering together, what we take for granted so much, is removed from us because of this COVID-19, uh, we have to find creative ways of getting together. And, and so part of this is, is we're doing this. But remember, we have a need to be together. And so God says that he will give us our daily bread, our daily needs. So Father, we again, we just ask you, Lord, that you would meet our daily needs for fellowship and fellowshipping with one another. This week, we're going to be focusing on forgiveness. And uh, I'm going to just read to you from the scriptures again, the Lord's Prayer, as we come together on this. So uh, we're going to be having a quick look at uh, Matthew chapter 6 and verses 9 to 13. I don't believe that the order of the prayer that Jesus prayed uh, and taught us how to pray is, is random. I don't think that Jesus did anything randomly or without purpose. And so I believe that even the order that we pray these things in has purpose. And the first thing that we read in the Lord's Prayer is, Our Father, may your name be kept holy. And of course, this is, uh, uh, is worship. We're worshipping God. We're magnifying his name. And we're saying, God, may your name be kept holy. And worship, of course, was Jesus' top priority. And that needs to be our top priority as well. And it goes on to say, may your kingdom come soon and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I'm reading from the NIV, just in case, uh, sorry, not the NIV, the NLT, just in case anybody wants to know. So the second is that God's will be done and not ours. And again, this is important because uh, the invitation to being a disciple is an invitation to come into relationship with the heavenly father, with the God of who created all things. And so we pray that, God, your will be done, not our will be done. Jesus goes on to say, give us today the food that we need. This is a, a petition for, again, as I just said, for our needs to be met. And we think about the order of this. How many times when we pray do we skip the first two, worship and praying God's will be done, and we jump straight to the third one, God, I need this. Give me this. Father, I have a need in this area. Fulfill my need or I want this and I want that. We have this list of things that we kind of our shopping list that we come before God with. And, uh, and, and, and this doesn't happen until after we've worshipped and after we've asked for God's will to be done, not our will to be done. See, sometimes I think we treat God like a sugar daddy and he's not a sugar daddy. He's a heavenly father. He's a good father. He then goes on to say, which is going to be our text that we're going to be looking at today, and forgive us our sins, as we have forgiven those who sin against us. 
What if the order of asking forgiveness came before the request for our needs to be met? Think about that. Think about the order. So we've just asked God to meet our needs and now we're asking him to forgive us. What if it was the other way around? What if we asked the Lord to forgive us first and then we went and asked the Lord for our needs to be met? I think what would happen is it would reinforce this idea that we have to earn acceptance to achieve or achieve a certain level of holiness before God will answer our prayers. Because at the end of the day, as, as human beings, we seem to be hardwired towards um, working out things for ourselves. And, and, uh, and we're kind of brought up that way that, you know, as we, we grew up, you know, uh, in ki as kids, you know, we behave ourselves and we get rewards. And when we behave badly, we have uh, benefits and rewards taken away from us. And, and we kind of approach God in the same kind of way. And I think if we had the Lord's Prayer in that order, where we had to ask forgiveness first and then have our needs being met, we'd kind of be reinforcing this idea that we have to earn acceptance. When Jesus places this afterwards, it reinforces, I think, a more powerful truth that we are loved and cared for by God because of grace and grace alone. You see, God is a good father and a gracious father. And he will meet our needs, not because of our goodness, not because we're, we're so amazing that, you know, he just wants to reward us for being good. Not at all. God forgives us because he's good. And then he gives us what we need because he loves us, not because we've worked for it, not for a reward or anything else. It is by grace and grace alone. And so I think that it's, it's, quite, it's quite poignant that God gives us our needs and meets our needs because he's a good father first. And then we move down into the next area where we say, okay, let's now start having a look at cleaning ourselves up. So let's have a look at uh, an aspect of forgiveness and fellowship. This is a, an idea that I really want you to, to grab a hold of because it's extremely helpful for us as we continue in our discipleship that we understand that as a Christian, although our sins have been forgiven, the sins that we commit as Christians do actually have an effect on our relationship with God. So in uh, 1 John 1 5, it says this. Now, this is the gospel message that we have heard from him and announced to you. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet keep on walking in darkness, we are lying and do not practice the truth. The discipline of forgiveness is one of the cornerstones of discipleship. And as we've said all throughout this series, that this is a discipleship prayer. Now, if we remember right the way back uh, to God's creation, when God created everything, created the world, he created humanity, the plants, the animals, everything in it. In fact, when God first created the universe and he stood back and he looked at it, he said, this is good. This is very good. So everything that God does is perfect. There is no, no shadow, no shift, no change, no turning in him. And when he creates something, he creates it after his own nature. And it was good and it was perfect. And it was just the way that he wanted it to be. Sin is a dark and it's a murky thing. And if you think about it, it actually has no legitimate place in God's creation at all. It doesn't belong. It was never created to be there. And this was something that was put in there because Satan caused mankind to sin and fall away from God. So sin came into the world because of Adam's sin right at the very beginning. But sin was never meant to be there. It's an illegitimate, it's an illegitimate thing that should never be part of God's creation. Sin separated humanity from God. When Jesus went to the cross, he paid the debt for our sin and we became children of God. We were reconciled back to God again. And when we sin as children of God, darkness comes between us and there again is a breakdown of relationship or fellowship with God. So that's after we become Christians. So, <clears throat> so there's these, this, this, this double aspect of, of sin and how sin operates. There's the sin that separates us from God from birth because we're born sinners. Jesus reconciles that relationship and we come back into fellowship with him. That relationship is mended. But as we sin... 
when we sin deliberately and when we sin as Christians after we get saved, after we come into the kingdom, what happens is that sin still then stands between us and God and there is a breakdown in that relationship. And I think you know this to be true because when we're out of fellowship, you know, we sense that we are distant from God. We sense that there's something between us and him, that the relationship isn't quite right. I want to tell you a, a bit of a story about uh, something that happened in my early, early years uh, as a Christian. I was uh, hanging out with a group of Christians at the time, and it was a, a real intense time uh, where we dedicated ourselves to the Lord. We, uh, we decided that we were going to get really serious about following Jesus. And, uh, and so we decided that we would forego everything else and that we would all meet together on a daily basis and we would spend uh, all of our time together eating meals together, talking about the Lord, praying, all that kind of stuff. It's a very, very intense time. And it's the kind of thing that you can do, you know, when you're uh, sort of in your late teens, early 20s and you don't have a job and you're at college and, uh, and you don't go to college. So, um, you know, so it's one of those things that you can do, uh, you know, when you've got the time to do it. And, uh, <clears throat> and I remember we, uh, you know, we, we were having a discussion and we were really talking about uh, the, the disparity that we see between our lives and what we read in the scriptures. And, uh, and so we, uh, we kind of, I made, this, I made this decision and I remember the, I remember the very moment that uh, that I uh, that I fell out of fell out of grace with God over this um, this intense time of fellowship that we have was uh, we sensed God's presence He was with us it, it was it was really actually a really joyful uh, uh, really joyful time I remember walking home coming back from uh, from this guy's house and I was just about three steps away from the curb two doors down from my house and I prayed this prayer. I said, God, if you're not going to do the work in me and you're not going to, going to make everything completely right right now, then you might as well just take me home. And instantaneously, the joy left me. The presence of God lifted. I completely, it's like I just came, came crashing down to earth in one instant. And what happened was, was when I reflected back on, on what happened there is that, if you like, I was blackmailing God. I was saying, God, if you don't hurry up and do this work that you talk about and you're not going to, you know, do all these things for me, then you might as well kill me. You might as well take me home. I was trying to blackmail God effectively. And of course, uh, we're, you know, that isn't the way that we're supposed to, to behave with God. It's not the sort of things that we're supposed to say. And, um, and right there, you know, uh, I sinned. I sinned against God and his presence left me. The relationship... Uh, just was instantaneously broken and it was literally like a, a flick of a switch and um, you know when when we sin there is an effect that that has on our fellowship with God Now that doesn't mean that we stop being children of God it doesn't mean that I suddenly you know once I was a child of God and now I'm not I'm kicked out of the house uh, we don't stop being children of God our identity never changes in that regard but our relationship with God does and if we think about our relationship with our own children, you know, we think about the fact that, uh, you know, when, when our kids are behaving well, uh, there's peace, there's joy, we enjoy each other's company. But when our children start behaving badly or they're rude or something like that, something happens in the relationship between us. They don't stop being our children. We don't stop loving them, but we're not very pleased with them at that time. And if they come to me after being rude to my face and then ask me for something, you know, the answer is going to be no. They need to put the relationship right before we can restore fellowship. And that's what I'm talking about here. When I'm talking about getting out of fellowship with God, is it's really, it's the breakdown of that immediate relationship. We are still saved. We are still children of God. But we need to attend to the relationship which is now damaged in some way because of our ongoing sin. So asking forgiveness removes the offense and it restores the relationship with God. So we're going to move on now to Conviction and condemnation. Forgiveness is one of the most important transformational practices for the disciple of Christ. This probably has uh, a greater uh, a greater role in in transforming who we are as people from what we were to what Christ wants us to be, probably than any other thing 
that I can think of when it comes to discipleship practices. And that's born out of experience as much as anything else. So the purpose of conviction is always, always to bring somebody closer into fellowship with God. Conviction is never comfortable because in the end, but in the end, it produces a harvest of peace and righteousness. And I want to read to you from John 16 and verse 8. This is, and when he comes, talking of the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of its sins and God's righteousness and the coming judgment. So Jesus here is talking to his disciples and he's talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And really that happens when we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes. But the Holy Spirit's work actually starts before we get saved. It starts while we're still far from God. And it says here that when the Holy Spirit comes, and he has come, he will convict the world of its sins and talk about God's righteousness and the coming judgment. So this is part of the work of the Holy Spirit, is to convict the world of sin, is to convict us of our sins. And as I've said, conviction is never comfortable, but it produces a harvest of peace and righteousness. Now, on the other hand, there's something called condemnation. And Satan is the one who brings condemnation because we have an adversary. We have an accuser of the brethren, as, as he's called. Satan is the accuser and the fault finder. And Satan doesn't bring conviction. Instead, he brings condemnation. And the fruit of condemnation is guilt and shame and worthlessness. He exerts an enormous amount of pressure on you to sin. And when you do, he kicks you when you're down and then heaps condemnation upon you for your failure. How do we know the difference then between conviction and condemnation? Well, the simple way of, of looking at it is that conviction will always draw you to Jesus and condemnation will always drive you away. Shame hides in darkness and is afraid of the light. And of course, as we know, Jesus is the light. So when we're faced with our sin, do we feel like hiding from Jesus? And if you do, then you're not listening to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Instead, you're listening to the condemnation of the devil. Because as I've said, when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, its always purpose is always to bring us to the foot of the cross. It's to bring us back into relationship with God. So forgiveness is a process. The next part of forgiveness, process, is confession. 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession is really about coming into agreement with God about our sin. It's a place of humility and it's a place of honesty where we take full responsibility for our part that we've played in our sin. See, when we make confession to God, we don't make excuses. We don't come before God and, and say, oh, well, you know, um, I, I was made to do it. And we don't blame others. Well, you know, this person made me do it. No, it's about taking full responsibility for ownership of our part to play in that sin. When we confess, we don't minimise and we don't deflect our guilt. So we don't try to, to skirt around the issue. We don't try to, to, uh, to minimise it is, and, and if to say, well, God, you know, that's just a little sin. It's a, that was a white lie. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not really that bad. It's a small sin, Lord. It's not a biggie like, uh, like everybody else does. You know, I only do small ones. So it doesn't try to minimise or deflect the guilt. And it doesn't couch it in, uh, in terms of, um, you know, God, I have a growth area. I have an area where I just need to do some improvement here, Lord. Uh, no, it doesn't do that. It calls sin a sin. And we face up to that. We take ownership and we take responsibility for our sin, for the part that we have played in it. And that is what confession does. Confession is when you look Jesus straight in the eye and you say, Jesus, you say this is a sin and I have sinned. So what happens when we confess our sins before God is that confession 
aligns our mind with the mind of God because we come into agreement with him and with his word about what sin is. So confession is important that it aligns our mind with the mind of God. The next part is godly sorrow. In 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, Paul writes, For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. You know, there's an aspect of forgiveness that involves godly sorrow. When you've hurt somebody that you love, you can kiss and make up, but there is a sorrow that accompanies it. And that's a sorrow because the relationship has been hurt and that you've hurt the other person. And the sorrow reinforces your determination not to hurt them again. You know, in serious cases, uh, it's like a scar that we wear uh, to remind us of the wound. I've got a, a scar as I look down here. I don't know if you can see it, you probably can't. But anyway, I have a scar on my wrist. And that was a wound that happened uh, a long, long time ago. And at the time, it, it hurt a lot. Um, but it's healed now. But every time I see that, it reminds me of that moment. And this is what godly sorrow does, is that godly sorrow uh, brings us back to that place where we're reminded again and we, say, and we become determined, I don't want to do that again because of the sorrow that I have, because it's hurt the other person and it's damaged the relationship that we have. Jesus himself carries scars, even now, on his hands and on his feet, and on his side. And when I look upon his scars, I'm reminded that it was my sin that put him there. And that causes me a certain degree of pain. Every time we take communion together, I'm reminded that was my sin that put him there. And even though he is perfected, he's resurrected, he has a new body and he sits at the right hand of the Father, he still has scars in his hands that are a reminder to me that was my sin. And there's a amount of godly sorrow that goes along with that when I think about that and I consider it because it was painful. It's painful to think that this is the Jesus that I love and I hurt him that much, but that he also loved me that much, that he endured the cross for my benefit and for yours. And that sorrow helps me. It helps me to be determined to live the kind of life that brings him glory and brings him honour. And so I hope that would do the same for you. Worldly sorrow, on the other hand, is not sorrow about the sin. Worldly sorrow, in fact, is more about being sorry that you got caught. It's more about being sorry that you have to pay the consequences of your sin. And when we truly understand that even small sins put us out of fellowship with God, and damage the relationship. In other words, there is, there is, in a real sense, there is a sense of withdrawal, even for the small things. When we understand that, and we understand that it hurts, even small sins hurt the heart of God, we move quickly back into fellowship with Him. So godly sorrow brings our emotions in line with the heart of God. After Jesus met His disciples on the road to Emmaus, he appeared to the disciples in the upper room and he opened their minds to the scriptures about him and how he, would, how he had to suffer and how he had to die for the whole world. And he goes on to show them scriptures about the gospel being preached by them to the world. It says in Luke 24 and verse 47, it was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem, that there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. Note here that repentance comes before forgiveness. Repentance is a crucial part of the gospel message and a call to action. The call to action is to turn away from our sin and turn to God. And the implication here is that there needs to be a corresponding change in lifestyle. So we have this confession, which is to change the mind. Then we have the godly sorrow aspect, which aligns our heart. Now there is a call to action. And there's a story in the New Testament where Jesus uh, goes and meets with a guy called Zacchaeus. 
Zacchaeus was a, was a chief tax collector, no doubt, not just an ordinary tax collector, but a chief tax collector. And uh, he wanted to see Jesus. He was the small guy that climbed up the tree. And Jesus stopped and he says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house uh, and we're going to go for dinner, which is always good when you invite yourself around to somebody else's house for dinner. So anyway, they did that. And of course, all the disciples and everybody uh, who were around knew who Zacchaeus was because uh, they call him a notorious sinner. So this was not just an ordinary sinner, not an ordinary tax collector. He was a notorious sinner and chief tax collector. So here's Jesus going to dinner with Zacchaeus. And uh, in, uh, he talks to Zacchaeus and, and whatever happens sort of within that conversation, we don't quite know. But anyway, Zacchaeus gets convicted. He gets convicted of his sin. He realizes in, in some way that, that Jesus is, is a messenger from God and he needs to repent. And so uh, he, he repents. And in Luke 19 verses 8 to 9, it says, Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor. Lord, and if I have cheated anyone on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this house today. So here we have this notorious sinner repents. He confesses his sins, but he doesn't just stop there. He actually makes a change in his lifestyle. He changes from cheating people on taxes. He decides that what he has already cheated, he's going to make restoration for it. And that's that's very much part of what the requirements of the Old Testament covenant were. And it's right that if we have done things that we should try to seek to make restitution for that. But at, at then, when repentance comes, Jesus then says, salvation, salvation has come to this home today. So Zacchaeus has a change in his lifestyle which shows the fruit of his repentance because repentance is shown by its fruit. And the fruit can be seen by others by the change of lifestyle and by the change of actions. The person that stole cheats and steals no more. The alcoholic and the addict that turn from their addictions begin a recovery process. The person with pornography addiction places themselves in accountability relationships. The desk-thumping boss, who's the dictator of his own little kingdom, hands the CEO's chair over to Jesus, pays his workers a fair wage, and his employees, he empowers to start making decisions and publicly honors them for a job well done. These are all examples of what, it, what a repentant lifestyle looks like. See, repentance isn't just about confession. Confession is getting into agreement with God. We also need to have repentance and repentance comes before the forgiveness of sins. It means it has to be a self-examination here and recognition that, you know, if this is a habitual sin, what am I going to do to change that? If this is a lifestyle issue, what am I going to do to change my lifestyle? Perhaps I'm going to have to cut some things out, stop seeing certain people, make a change to the things that I do, possibly the things that I allow. It might even be that, that uh, you need to uh, actually start doing some things if the, if the case is that you've been not doing the right thing. So repentance has fruit. We can see it in a change of lifestyle and a change of action. Repentance is the fruit of praying what we've already prayed in the Lord's Prayer. Your will be done. So when we pray that prayer and there is a corresponding repentance as we move into this part of the prayer on forgiveness, we see that in fact we're fulfilling that part of your will be done in my life. Lord, that you might start seeing in me the kind of lifestyle, the kind of changes and the things that you want to see in my life. So repentance is about aligning our will with the will of God. So let's move on to the part about forgiveness and cleansing. In Psalm 103 and verse 12, it says, He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. After conviction, confession, sorrow and repentance, we're now in the place where we can receive forgiveness. Forgiveness is a gift of grace. 
We can't earn it. We can't demand it. We can't beg for it. We can only ask for it and receive it as a gift. Here, God has bound himself to his word that he will forgive when we ask. His character, as I've mentioned before, is that he is unchanging. And because he's unchanging, he is dependable. He was not going to change his mind and he doesn't have he doesn't have favorites so he's not going to choose to forgive one person because he likes them better than you and you well you dirty little sinner he's just not gonna not gonna forgive you at all he's gonna make you suffer a little bit longer that's not that's not what god is like at all he's a good father he loves all of his children equally and he has promised bound himself by his word when you come and you ask me forgiveness i will forgive you when god forgives he forgets it says here as we just read that when he forgets, he places our sin as far away from us and from him as the east is from the west. Now, I don't know if anybody has tried to find where the boundary line is between the east and the west, but east just keeps on going and west just keeps on going. And it's, it's, a, it's a term that really means that it's as far away as it gets. It's completely forgotten, totally forgotten. It's as far away from God as it can possibly get. God will never bring it up and he will never count it against us. Unlike some people who, when we get into arguments or there's, there's a disruption in the relationship, you know, they seem to drag out the past every single time. And, uh, and you need to know that God will never do that. You know, God will never drag your past up. God will never rub your nose in it. You know, once it's been forgiven, it is forgotten. And that's really, really important that we understand this. His forgiveness is total. So the challenge then for us is that if God's forgiveness is total, when we confess our sins and he forgives us, he removes that sin and will never, ever, ever bring that up before us again. Do we forgive ourselves the same way? You know, do we keep on holding ourselves to ransom over things that we've done wrong? Or do we take a leaf out of God's book that when we have truly confessed and repented of that sin, do we remove that as far away from ourself as the East is from the West? Because that is what God does. Now, I know it's difficult sometimes because You know, in our memories, when we remember these things, we put ourselves under condemnation. And the enemy certainly loves to bring up our past and keep reminding us of our failures and keep reminding us of the fact that, you know, this is the 10th time this week that we've done this. And uh, but again, that is not conviction. That is condemnation. And we can condemn ourselves and the enemy can condemn us. But when we truly come to the forgiveness of God, we need to have the same discipline as God does and remove that sin as far from us as the east is from the west. So when the enemy tries to come by and remind you and condemn you for what you've done in the past, or when you bring it up, because that's your habit and that's maybe a sin that you need to confess, then you need to put it as far away from the east as from the west. So here's what I do. Whenever something happens and I'm reminded of a sin or something like that, that I know I put under the blood of Jesus Christ, I speak to that voice, whether it's mine or whether it comes to the enemy. And I say, no, I'm not having this. It's under the blood and that's where it's staying. And I carry on. See, when we resist the enemy, he flees from us. But it's also about disciplining myself and disciplining my mind, because otherwise I become a slave to being sin conscious rather than being a slave to Jesus Christ and living in freedom. So when we are forgiven, the blood of Jesus not only forgives us, but washes us and cleanses us. I want to read to you a passage from Hebrews 9 and 13. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Do you know, after leading dozens and dozens of people through confession and repentance, the most common remark that I get back is, I feel lighter or I feel like there is a burden that's lifted from me. And particularly when we have been confessing and repenting and leading people through that process when it comes to sexual sin, 
they say, I feel clean. And it's, it's, it's an incredible thing to watch when somebody moves from that place of, of having that murky darkness over their life to being completely forgiven and then cleansed. How they, they have this, this, just this wonderful sense, their face and countenance changes, their posture changes. You know, when I do counseling, oftentimes, you know, when we're at the beginning, the people will be, they'll be kind of, their body language will all be tight and they'll be hunched shouldered and, and they'll avoid, avoid looking at me. And by the end of it, when they've been forgiven and they've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, they're relaxed, they're open faced, they've got joyful smiles and they just have this sense of peace, this incredible peace upon their whole life. And that's because that weight of sin has been removed. You know, forgiveness cleanses our conscience from guilt. And guilt is a heavy, heavy burden. And when that burden of guilt is then removed because we've been forgiven, they feel lighter. And, and you may have experienced this yourself, that suddenly that when you've had this thing that you've been you've been holding on to and you confess that to somebody and all of a sudden the burden of guilt is lifted as your conscience is cleansed and sin stains us sin stains us it, it, it's like uh it's like in ghostbusters you know we get slimed you know sin is dirty it's like walking through mud we get filth on us and and sin has this way of of clinging to us and when we've been forgiven we get cleansed we get cleansed and forgiven, and it's uh, it's like uh, it's like it feels like when you've just had a shower, uh, and then you've changed the bed sheets, and all the bed sheets are really clean, and you've come out of the shower and you've tried off, and you you get underneath your 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 bed clothes, and you just slip into those clean bed sheets, and everything smells good, and you just feel that sense of comfort, uh, and that's what that cleansing feels like. It feels because everything is new and everything is clean and everything is fresh. And that's what the cleansing of the blood of Jesus does. Cleansing also includes healing and deliverance. James 5, 15 and verse 16 <clears throat> says, Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And if you've committed any sins, they will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. So the effects of sin can also bring sickness and open the door to the demonic. And the demonic brings defilement. It brings that sense of, of dirtiness. Forgiveness removes the legal right of entry for these things. It's like, uh, it's like when we sin, we hand the front door key over to the enemy in our life and forgiveness removes that legal right of entry. It's like when we get forgiven, uh, we, we take the key back from the enemy and we take the key back from sickness and from demonic squatters. And then comes the cleansing. And in verse in verse 16, it says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you might be healed. In Christ, we've been called to minister forgiveness and healing to one another by confessing to one another and facilitating the forgiveness process, which is what we've been going through. It's a powerful ministry and it brings great freedom and joy to both the receiver and the minister. So again, we'll be doing more teaching and giving opportunity to minister one to another in this area of forgiveness and in deliverance, in healing and deliverance later on. So we'll be doing that together. Now, there's another aspect uh, of this prayer. The Lord's Prayer is a prayer of revival. In Matthew 6 and verse 12, it says, forgive us our sins. So again, there's this corporate aspect of this prayer. And when we intercede and petition on behalf of others, we pray, forgive us our sins. We include those who are far off for Jesus, our relatives, our neighbours, our village, our city, and even the world. 
So when we pray, Lord, forgive us our sins, it's a cry for revival. I want you to imagine for a minute what would happen if all the Christians in Ottawa prayed for forgiveness for the sins of our city. What would happen if the conviction of the Holy Spirit then began to fall on the people? You know, this is something which has happened in all the great revivals that have ever been. In Wales, the jails were empty and the churches were full. In the Great Awakening here in North America, the conviction of the Holy Spirit arrested people out in the streets and they dropped to their knees and they repented where they were. The entire communities were swept into the kingdom of God because the conviction of the Holy Spirit came upon the people. So what was the key to this revival? What was the key to the Great Awakening? What was the key to all of the revivals that have ever happened? The key has always been intercessory prayer, where the saints are on their knees praying to God that he would forgive the sins of the people and draw them to Christ. I want to ask you, do you want revival? Do you want revival in our community? If we do, then as we pray the Lord's Prayer, we also need to include prayer and intercession for our city. God, forgive our city, forgive our town, forgive our relatives, forgive our loved ones for the sins that we have committed. Lord, will you come and bring the conviction of your Holy Spirit, remembering that the conviction of the Holy Spirit is always to draw people into presence with Jesus. So forgive us our sins. We've gone through and had a look at conviction, confession, sorrow, repentance, forgiveness, cleansing, and healing. Do we want to see people set free? Do we want to be set free? Do we want to live in peace and in joy? Do we want our community and our families to be saved? Then we need to pray. And we need to pray fully, deeply, and daily the Lord's Prayer, particularly where he says, Lord, forgive us our sins. So let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we've forgiven those who've sinned against us. And don't lead us into temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Amen.